Hi, and welcome to the latest episode of Wall Street Wildlife from a bleary badger, literally straight off a plane, and a Christoph who's imminently flying home to the good old US of A. How's your Sicily Poland trip wrapping up, buddy? Uh, it's been really delightful. And I have to be honest, I'm not looking forward to getting back to the Austin weather, which I saw is between 75 and humid and 100. What's that in real numbers? It's just really nasty. <laughs> just really, really nasty. I've, uh, if you, I don't know if you've been tracking me on Strava, but uh, I've been running in Budapest a couple of times and I've had to be setting my alarm clock for like 6 a.m. to run because it's just like 33 which I don't know what that is, but it's a lot. It's a lot of Fahrenheit as well. Yeah. So before I, I ask you about your travels, I'll say one thing. Life here in small town Sicily is really delightful. And I've been astounded by how much there is to do in such a small place. I mean, it's not that small. It's like 50,000 people. But there's a really wonderful sense of community and a lot of cultural things that I didn't expect would be at this level, including art shows and queen cover bands. And <laughs> um, so it was sad uh, watching the Italy soccer football team lose the other day for the Euro, Euro Cup and that night having the queen cover band having to perform We Are the Champions. <laughs> wow. <laughs> but I made okay. the grief with, with uh, Cannoli every single day with uh, okay. the occasional bonus of Granita. Okay. Um, I've not been following the football, uh, so but commiserations if Italy are no longer in it. <laughs> so your travels, you're the one that's been having real adventures as, as usual. You were in Budapest and you just made it home. What, were, what was an exciting highlight for you? So we, yeah, Budapest was awesome, actually. It was straight on the back of a motorbike tour with a bunch of buddies. Uh, as you might remember, my motorbike was stolen, so I flew to Milan, rented a bike, Spent about a week up and down mountains, having a lot of fun in ski resorts in the summer, and then did nine days in Budapest, and it finished with a, a sort of bachelor party that wasn't a bachelor party, i.e. none of my none of that gang of male friends has got married recently, so we feel like, hey, we, uh, we deserve a bachelor party, so we kind of went for the party without the bachelor, as it were. That was, that was fun. But we did lots of uh, cultural stuff. Um, probably only had one day of literally like 12 hours solid drinking. Everything else was actually pretty cultural. I feel like I've seen Budapest quite well. Recommended on the itinerary, on travel itineraries for those who have not. Yeah, 100%. Been. Yeah, it's a, I mean, we were staying in a nice area. I had a beautiful apartment. I was pretty happy with uh, my setup. But yeah, like it's very reasonable uh, sort of cost wise to go out, especially if you're from the US of A. I'm sure everything feels very cheap. Um, good food, lots to see, lots of history, lots of architecture. Um, lots of really interesting history from post World War Two, and uh, and a sort of co a revolution against communism and how the country changed. Um, so yeah, yeah, it was uh, fascinating. I highly recommend. All right, well, I will definitely return. Well, welcome back home. I'm glad you got home safe and sound. I always worry about you and your motorbike uh, doing. You know, <laughs> I mean, it's 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 a dangerous life you lead. Badger. You know, uh, and, and maybe this teases us into our headline topic of today. I've realized I'm now starting to suffer cognitive decline myself. <laughs> I'm, I'm becoming increasingly dazed and confused personally. So for the first time, uh, like I never lose anything. I'm always pretty sharp, but, I, but we st I stayed in so many different places on the bike trip and it was relatively hectic. So I'm going to maybe give myself a pass, but I managed to lose like something fairly critical every single day of the motorbike trip from like running shorts to my electric toothbrush <laughs> to like my razor uh -huh. to some other, like I've just, everywhere I seem to leave like this strew of toiletries and clothing behind me. I had to keep replacing things as I went, which is very unlike me. So I do worry if perhaps like another notable public figure, I might be suffering cognitive decline. What do you think? Well, uh, that's a nice segue, but have you checked whether your head's still attached? Uh, it's the thing connected to your shoulders. Uh, I'm, I'm looking relatively intact, yes. Okay, all right. Yeah, so uh, what is it? Last week on Thursday, the yes. presidential debate happened and everybody is up in arms that we, in fact, have no same candidate to choose from. We, meaning yeah. uh, people in the United States. And I suppose our topic is, does this matter in any way for us as investors? 
I'll I'll summarize the top level the way I see it. Um, I don't like Trump because I don't trust his character in the sense of I don't believe what he says. So it's hard for, I, I don't know, it, to me, it seems like it's hard for people to build successful businesses and industries when you can't believe the person in charge, right? On the other hand, uh, Joe Biden was obviously severely, his, his cognitive capacities were severely diminished and it was clearly on display. And there's, you know, the whole Democratic Party is up at arms. Like we knew this was coming. Now this is here. And now what? So between this rock and a hard place, as an investor, are we rooting for any one candidate in particular? Does the business world seem to prefer one over the other if my description has any merit whatsoever? What do you think? I, mean, I, th I think the business world certainly does. If you're a purely a capitalist, you probably do prefer uh, the Republican Party and Trump. He's more business friendly, I think, in, in a number of ways. Whether that's the right outcome for the world and for geopolitics, who knows? It's a it's a bit of a, is it a Hobson's choice or a Sophie's choice where you basically have no good decision to make? I don't, like this, we're, we're recording on Monday the 1st. We're going to get this podcast out on Tuesday the 2nd. Like we might get overtaken by the news. It does look like on Twitter, some informed folk on the fringes of the Biden camp might be suggesting that uh, Biden's going to stand down. I mean, I, I don't know that that will happen myself, but it's a possibility, that's for sure. Yeah, you know, one thing I'll add is, uh, and I'm sorry for repeating this ad nauseum, is that as a systems thinker, I always try to recognize that these individual variables need time to play out. So when I hear two candidates essentially blaming the other, you know, for the problems and the shortcomings we're experiencing today, it's so inaccurate, it really bothers me. It's, you know, the Biden campaign saying it was Trump's fault that we had so much debt. And the Trump campaign is saying, no, it's Biden's fault. We have so much debt. And neither party on any level is willing to take any responsibility. Meanwhile, the debt spiral is, you know, growing out of control. So I remain really, really worried about the state of the economy. And I just can't see how any of these two approaches, meaning ones that I guess, reduce a complex thing to talking points will offer any solution that doesn't continue to make things worse. You know, that it just, it's just like a form of kicking the bucket down the road. So um, I'm quite pessimistic at the moment. I guess it's a long time between now and November. My eyes are down on the uh, UK election in just three days time. I've come home to see my ballot paper here. So I'm getting ready to file that tonight, and post it off. But um, you guys have got another what, five or six months before you have to have your own election, a lot could change. You know, maybe at least one of the candidates changes. Maybe Biden was just having a bad day and maybe they do keep the next debate in the diary and maybe he knocks it out of the park. I mean, it would take a very compelling performance in, in, a, in a subsequent debate with Trump, I think, for Biden to recapture the uh, momentum in the, in this race. Like if you... I was, I'd, I don't know how accurate they tend to be, but there's a quite a lot of money on the line. I, I tend to think that looking at the gambling odds, the gambling line can give you some insight into these things because people, it's not just opinion then, people actually put hard cash up to back up their position. Donald is a significant favorite. If I were to bet a dollar on uh, Trump today, I'd only win 72 cents. If I bet that same dollar on Biden, I'd win $5.80. So... It's quite a stark difference in terms of how confident the, at least the gamblers are that Trump's going to take the win. The guy I follow for that kind of stuff is Nate Silver and his blog 538. And I believe mm. before the debate, it was, uh, he runs really st sophisticated statistical analyses from across all the polling and whatnot. I believe it was 50-50 before the debate, and it's certainly shifted in Trump's favor after. But one thing I don't believe is that what this was, was just a bad day for Biden. Unfortunately, as we age, our capacities continue to decline rather than, you know, get better. And so he could have been, so I'll reframe it this way. He could have been having a bad day, true, but it's not like two years from now, he's going to be that much sharper, right? There's no way that's impossible. Yeah. You know, from an investor standpoint, 
I guess it it will come down to the policies that we're dealing with. And I think the real, um, like you said, Trump is probably favored by business people. But I'm also worried about all the clean energy initiatives that he might take off the table because some of his talking points were, you know, absurd. Like him saying, under my policies, we still had H2O. <laughs> Meanwhile, Biden is the guy that actually, you know, built all kinds of solar farms and wind farms and made clean energy, you know, a really profitable industry over the last four years. Yeah, Biden's uh, Inflation Reduction Act was really like a very badly named set of incentives around things like sustainable energy and lots of other things. But that was a, quite a headline thing within that. Um, I don't know that Trump can repeal those, um, not without Senate approval, but he can certainly make it more difficult for clean energy companies, solar batteries, companies like that to prosper in the way they are today. But then there's a bunch of other sectors that probably will do quite well. Like if we say on energy, probably oil and gas, that's those those sort of non-renewable energy sectors are going to do fairly well under a Trump presidency because he's all for fracking and exploiting America's oil reserves. And then small business, like he's, I guess he is business friendly. He made a big hoo-ha in his shtick over the last month or two about deregulating um, and making it easier to do business. And I think that's probably true, to be fair. And companies that have struggled to do M&A under the current FTC oversight, um, you know, a lot of headline acquisitions have been challenged by the FTC. Under a Republican government, that's probably going to slacken off. Uh, so it'll be easier for companies to expand non-organically. Yeah, I agree with everything you said. The takeaway I have from the business standpoint is one of almost bewilderment. If I ask myself what it would take to be hired, you know, as a, at a call it top tier tech company, right? You you go in for your interviews, you go through a series of pretty intense questioning and no doubt, you know, uh, mental agility tests and exams of one sort or another. Can you imagine what would happen to you if you were a candidate equivalent to Trump or Biden as they performed in the debate, meaning like actually using sentences that are not only not grammatical, but nonsensical? You wouldn't make it past five minutes of the interview, right? And so that these guys are the two candidates uh, applying, in a sense, for the world's most, I would say, crucial and challenging and complex job, in that these business leaders, in some ways, who know what it's like, what it takes to make crucial, complicated decisions, are somehow still cheerleading for their guy. It's kind of bewildering that I'm not hearing more often from people like we need somebody else besides these two. People are still sort of like sticking to their uh, political bias. That, that bothers me. I don't think it's, I think you'd be a, probably a foolish business leader if you came out with a very strong political position. You're probably asking for your company to get censured in some way, whether you've got private opinions that you share at dinner parties might be a different thing. Yeah, that, that's true. That's a good reminder. Well, that sounds to me like a possible segue into talking about investing in an increasingly dangerous world. Do you want to give us an update, Luke, on what you're thinking for yourself in terms of your own focus in the next coming weeks and months? Yeah. You know, I've been thinking about breadth of my own investments. And I've got a whole bunch of different stocks across all sorts of sectors. And I'm tech centric and North America centric, but broadly, fairly diversified across all sorts of different areas of technology, like everything is technology these days. But there's one area, which I sort of, maybe I, I'm sort of horrified to feel is a growth area, like everyone's going to get bored of AI at some point soon, and the tide is going to turn. But I think one area that is going to be incredibly resistant and just increasingly important is the fact that the world is increasingly dangerous. And what do I mean by that? Ever rising cyber security threats. You know, we're seeing some, something headline piece almost every day about another, another company or another government uh, that's been hacked or subjected to malware or lost data. There's something bad has happened. Public safety, gun crime is still a very serious social problem in the US. I think there's a lot that technology can do to improve public safety. 
And then also, I'm afraid, like military, technology, defense, um, some of the big companies like Lockheed and L3 Harris, Harris, but actually also some interesting private companies like Anduril. I think we're going to see some interesting stuff happening in that space, precipitated, unfortunately, by the sad situation in the Middle East and also in Ukraine still. So I'm, I would like to turn my focus to those areas in particular. So my plan uh, on the Twitters and the LinkedIn's is to um, really focus my research time on those three subsectors. And I'm badging that as an increasingly dangerous world. So right now, I'm putting together a kind of industry-wide review of cybersecurity. I own a bunch of companies in this space myself, but I own some of the really big ones. And maybe it'd be interesting to uh, get down to the nitty gritty and see if I can spot any tiny little companies as well in the same sector that might be important in the future. Mm -hmm. Would you reckon to that focus area, exciting or scary? Both, to be honest. <laughs> I'm glad, you know, I'm glad there are good guys, if I could call them that, you know, fighting the upcoming tsunami of AI based criminals. And I mean, all of those things are terrifying. I've watched enough Black Mirror episodes to kind of have, you know, a very dark vision of just how bad things could get. And, um, you know, with sprinkled with some, some serious AI experts who are sounding the alarms about just how bad it could get. Uh, having someone like you continue to refine your focus on what are the best of the best companies that will continue to grow and mature in this space and try to keep us safe, I think is essential. Um, not just from, you know, the, and how to make money in this situation perspective, but also for our own personal well-being and sleep well at night quotient. So I'm glad you're doing that work. I suppose if I have uh, any analog to that, uh, right now, my mind is very much on the battery space. EOS had um, a really good development this morning. They finally put, put up their automated line. And so anytime I think of AI, I think of an increasing demand for electricity and that electricity needs to be stored somewhere. So with Bitcoin rising and clean energy farms going up, and AI expanding, um, knowing your batteries well is going to be essential. So that might be my counterpoint to what you're doing. So between the two of us, I think we have our eyes on on some important sectors. Very good. Very interesting, Christoph. Yeah. Uh, let, let's see how this whole area plays out. Let's take us on to our closing topic for the day, because you have been reading about financial statements. What is it you want to share with our audience? Sure. Uh, I think financial statements are often a roadblock to many investors because unless you took finance and unless your numbers dweeb, you know, they are often quite complicated and don't always show up looking the same and numbers can mean slightly different things and there's negatives and parentheses and it gets kind of overwhelming for some people. I personally don't think financial statements are anywhere near the end all and be all of being a successful investor. But, you know, if you want to be serious about this, you have to know them. And so I'm always, uh, as I'm, as I make my way across FinTwit, every so often I find investing professionals post some version of their version of what financial statements are, how they work and what they mean. And I came across one from at I am Clint Murphy is a real estate developer and he has quite a large following on X. And I found his summary of what the three financial statements are and how to think of them really refreshing. So he said that uh, a balance sheet is equivalent to asking, is your business stable? And recall that a balance sheet is a snapshot in one particular moment in time. And it basically weighs how much you have and what you have versus what you owe. And I suppose what's left over is called the equity. But if you have an imbalance there, sort of like a seesaw, like too much of what you owe and not enough of what you have, you could say in a sense that your business is unstable, uh, which would be a red flag or a good flag if it's the other way. The income statement is probably the most familiar one, which shows you 
more or less how much money you're making and whether you're turning a profit or losing money each time you report, which is usually for our purposes quarterly. And then the last one is the statement of cash flows or cash flow statement. And his equivalent for this one is will you survive? Because it shows a snapshot in time from, a, from one date to another exactly how much cash went into your business and how much went out. And you have to remember that you might have the world's best business, but if you run out of cash for whatever time period, you can't buy, in a simple example, more lemons for your lemonade stand, you will go bankrupt uh, regardless of how hot the weather is and how many people want to buy your lemonade. So that, that frame, will you survive, I think is really helpful. So just wanted to share that with our listeners and encourage you all to, I don't know, um, not be so scared of financial statements if you use this reframe. What do you think of it? Uh, yeah, that must make sense to me. That's, that's, that's probably, I think there's a whole bunch of questions. Like you, like his questions there were, are you stable? Are you profitable? Will you survive? It's like a whole bunch of questions when you really get under the covers that between them, like the financial statements can help you answer uh, around the viability of the business, the sustainability of the business, and like the future potential of the business and how the CEO, at least, or maybe, maybe the founder still is directing the company and their long-term vision. I, I think it's probably the most important evolution in my own process as an investor was to take the financials far more seriously mm -hmm. since I took a bit of a battering in 2022. And I think I was probably in that camp of many growth investors through 2018, 2019, 2020, where the numbers almost didn't matter. The valuation almost didn't matter. You know, you're just trying to buy a big story and you probably make out like a bank robber. But clearly when the, well, that Buffett saying, when the tide goes out, as it did in 2022, you see who's wearing the bathing suit and who's not. And uh, I was caught with my pants off, certainly in some parts of my portfolio. So uh, yeah, getting much more into the numbers. And it seems hard at f first, but it doesn't take long. Like if you really just, if you just stop read, like the most, most useful thing an investor could do, I think, is just start reading like the 10Q. Read, it looks really boring. And it's just like this 30, 40 page PDF with a bunch of tables in it. But you, you get into a flow and actually you can, once you get used to reading them, you can blast through one in like half an hour and you learn a lot about the business. So, uh, and there's lots more you can do beyond that. But I think that's a really good thing for an investor in individual companies to make part of their process rather than just relying on other analysts to tell them what their opinion should be. Yeah, agree. Though I would make a small distinction between, say, what happened in 2022, which were, let's say, for simplicity's sake, issues of valuation, which I think are easily, relatively easy, captured by some ratios like, for example, the famed PE, PS, PEG, growth rate ratios, versus what I'm talking about, you know, like the balance sheet, income statement, and statement of cash flows, those three intertwined, almost like x-rays of a company can get really, really granular. And they don't necessarily, uh, at some point, it can be like a little bit too much information, which doesn't impact big picture stuff. So in a sense, like to argue against my point, you could have been wary of valuations without having looked at any of these financial statements you could have just looked at a summary ratio but i think it's, it is important to train yourself to do all the things agreed so just a small nuance and again if if you're a beginner and you hear the word balance sheet that is sort of an abstract name especially or if you attach to it something like the 10 uh, k or 8q or any of these you know jargon jargonistic words but if you think to yourself instead, oh, that's the document that helps me answer whether this business is stable, I think the path into them becomes a little easier. And that's kind of all I'm saying. Okay, pretty good. All important things to do as an investor. All right. So this has been uh, another episode of Wall Street Wildlife. 
uh, slightly abbreviated because Badger is home and weary from his travels. I am uh, weary from eating too many cannolis. <laughs> but next time we record, I think we'll be much more settled and grounded. I back in Austin and Luke settled into his uh, home in the UK. Yes, sir. Uh, if you enjoy our banter, you can find more of us at wallstreetwildlife.com. We've still got our 10 Laws of the Investing Jungle download for your delectation. We're also on YouTube and uh, all major podcast platforms. And if you want to chat to us, go find us on Twitter or X. I'm at 7 Luke Hallard. And I am at 7 Flying Platypus. And if you don't mind, take a minute of your time and write us a review. That would help us a lot. Yeah, we definitely would appreciate a star rating on Apple Podcasts or a review on Spotify. Very helpful. Are you ready to become a beast of an investor? Your journey starts here. A reminder that the people on this program may hold positions in the companies that are mentioned. Buying and selling stock carries financial risk, which could include loss of capital. The views in this program should not be taken as personalized advice. Before acting on any of the information provided, listeners are encouraged to consult a financial or tax professional.